I'm here with uh, Dr. James Stanger and Frank Adam and Jaron Schmidt. James, you want to take it away? So I'm happy to be here, everybody. I'm here with Jaron Schmidt. Um, Jaron Schmidt is in charge for Pearson View of uh, social networking strategies. How you doing, Jaron? Doing quite well, thank you. And you are calling in today from Minneapolis, is that right? That is right, the fine state there of uh, Minnesota. All right, so uh, we have Minnesota, and then I'm calling in from Washington State, and Lisa and Frank Adam are calling in from, uh, uh, from Phoenix, from Tempe, Arizona. How you doing, Frank? Excellent. Very Fantastic. Good. Well, uh, let's go ahead and get things started here. Uh, so we have Jaron here. I'm James Stanger. And the uh, agenda is going to be basically discussion of case studies, how we've, uh, people have gotten product launches started, how Jaron used uh, social networking for product launches and brand awareness to, uh, during events to help with customer service and advertising. Jaron's also going to support um, going to discuss some of his favorite resources. So, uh, and then we'll be uh, uh, ready to take some questions from folks. A little bit about Jaron. Jaron is the manager of social strategies, working for Pearson for over a decade. Um, so Pearson is a major textbook publisher, a testing provider. Um, uh, revenue, about $9 billion. So they, you guys do pretty well, don't you, Jaron? We do uh, okay, yeah. We're large. <laughs> about one in three textbooks in a student's book bag is from Pearson. And uh, Jaron works for a division that uh, basically also is over uh, testing. So if you've ever uh, taken a high-stakes certification exam, chances are you've also taken it from Pearson. Jaron started as a customer service rep and then became a web designer. He's responsible, uh, and then moved into social media. Uh, you're responsible, right, Jaron, for the strategy, the products, and the architectures used for social media. Do you, do you care to tell us a little bit about some of your responsibilities real quick? Yeah, no, that's totally fine. Um, so as you see, the strategy, I, I break it up into strategy as well as community management and then kind of the um, social support and marketing, which is more of where we're heading today. But day-to-day, uh, -day I've been responsible for everything from internal uh, social media launches. So in other words, having our employees get onto a social network and better collaborate and perform their day-to-day -day tasks on an internal behind our firewall network, as well as um, private label externals, both for partners as well as customers. That would be kind of more of the community management side of things. And then um, an all-encompassing kind of social customer support and marketing. So looking at different ways to use platforms, different marketing campaigns that we can push out, as well as uh, social media monitoring and uh, leveraging any of the analytics that go along with that. Well, thanks, man. Thank you very much for the, the overview, Jaron. Now, um, Jaron uh, is talking to us here in the name of uh, CIW, a skills-based education program. We're vendor neutral. We're globally accepted. We're created by web experts and designed by education experts. And uh, Jaron is very nicely uh, uh, offered to uh, help us with our webcast to talk more about social networking. CIW is used by learning centers, universities, secondary schools, worldwide, uh, community colleges all over the place. We have an advisory council that we work very closely with uh, each of these individuals to make CIW what it should be. It's a nexus, a cross section of industry, academia, uh, and nonprofit. As a result of our efforts, Internet.com has named CIW a top developer certification. And everybody's going to get a copy of this, uh, of this particular um, slide deck. So you can grab this link and go take a look at why CIW has become a top developer cert. Uh, worldwide, we have acceptance for the Department of Defense in the United States, eSkills and City and Guilds in England, the Scottish Qualifications Authority, all have um, signed off on CIW. ISC Squared, the creators of CISSP, uh, sort of security certification, recognize CIW's leadership in web design and development, and even use our certification as an experience waiver. And we have many people uh, over the years uh, and, and recently who have indicated their support for CIW worldwide. So, Jaron, let's talk a bit about some of the things that you accomplish or try to accomplish when it comes to uh, a social media campaign. I mean, are these the fundamental questions that you ask yourself every day? You know, what is the business objective for this campaign, and, and what are the metrics? Are, are, does that kind of put it in a nutshell, the types of questions that you ask yourself, or do you have other things to say about this particular slide? You know, um, 
I think, yeah, this is in a nutshell what I'm going after each and every day. When we talk a, a lot of times about social media, you know, you can get a little ambiguous. You can start to talk about how it's a moving target and how, you know, it's so new and developing that it's really hard to define some um, ways in which you can prove the ROI of social media. And so, um, you know, that's people have used that, I think, in our industry as a scapegoat. And I feel as though, you know, it's no different than any other business activity where you are trying to solve a business problem. And there should be a means by which that you are held accountable for that right. based on some sort of success metric. Yeah, and so, I think um, that's the key. Yeah. I, yeah that's the key, I think, isn't it? For, yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, even um, on a project that I've been re working on recently where we're defining mm -hmm. kind of our social monitoring strategy for all of Pearson, uh, you know, when you start getting all of this data coming at you and you take a step back, you have to really be able to say, is there tangible results that I can work off of? And mm -hmm. we're finding, you know, even in this particular project, in some cases, no. You know, and that's really hard for a marketer to ever have to admit that there are certain cases where they aren't as, uh, you know, uh, they aren't providing as much tangible value as they'd like to because on the outside we think we're doing everything right, you know. So that's right, absolutely. When you are putting together a, a social media campaign, uh, this next slide is meant to uh, to suggest the types of assets that you can leverage. I mean, you have, for example, you know, Pearson's content or your uh, exams, that sort of thing, but also the employees, people who are influencers or or company specific resources. What what kind of when you ask yourself what assets can we leverage? What are some of the examples that you've? Uh, what examples you can give us when it comes Absolutely. to uh, campaigns you've been working on? Right. So um, you know, if we're going to start and say what is the problem that we're going to solve, like we showed on that last slide, the next thing we have to do is okay, what can we use in order to solve that problem? And so, um, especially when we're looking at marketing-focused campaigns, mm -hmm. where we're trying to either build brand awareness or um, increase our market share with a particular product, we have to take a look at: Do we have um, interesting blog posts that we can be leveraging? Um, interesting content, such as videos, audio files, webinars, whatever it might be, um, that we can can start distributing through the various social platforms or channels. You know, you'll also take a look at our employees that we have. That we, you know, you might be a company of two. You might be a company of you know, like Pearson size of forty some thousand. Um, the nice thing about social is that you can scale some of your activities a lot easier by working through the other employees that you have around you. Again, whether it's two or forty thousand, anyone can hop onto these platforms and go ahead and be a publisher. There's a you know there's a double edged sword with that, but it still uh, brings up a fine point that you know you can scale a lot better than before. Uh, the other thing that you look at potentially is influencers. We'll maybe talk about this a little bit later on, but um, mm -hmm. you know as you develop your campaigns, looking through are there other people that have more influence than you that can you can potentially network with to help spread your message or spread your cause. You know in the world of social media, it's a little bit more of an earned right to talk to people as opposed to just pushing a message on someone. And so networking with other individuals who have that influence, who have already earned the right to talk to people is somewhat valuable at times. And then uh, company specific resources. Here would be uh, existing channels or, you know, like in the publishing industry, for example, we have authors and we mm -hmm. have um, networks of people that we can leverage. You know, every company I think has a unique uh, resource that they can discover in some way. They just have to go looking for it. Very good. So when it comes to uh, uh, influencers, uh, getting a poster child to help you, you know, whether it be a department or a particularly influential person in the customers, and one of great, a uh, great way to get started. Absolutely, and you know, it's a, it's a, like I said, a double-edged sword there as well, because you could find someone that has a ton of influence, and uh, they could be not too pleased with your product or with your marketing scheme, and actually, it could, you know. It, it could come back to hurt you more than it can help you. I think there's plenty of examples out there of um, individuals like uh, I believe it was either one of the major car industry or car companies, either Ford or Chevy, kind of yeah. I, I believe it was Ford opened up kind of the channels to have all these influencers talk about their brand new car that they would love, and huh. um, you know it turns out that a lot of people didn't like the car, didn't like the design, and it came back to bite them a little bit. So. Yeah, Ford had that problem like 50 years ago with the Edsel, and it sounds like they've repeated it recently. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but you know, I will say, even if it wasn't Ford, to their credit, that's a company that has done a really good job in the long haul. Um, if you want to Google and look ah. up their Fiesta campaigns and some of the stuff that they've done on social, they're kind of a poster child in um, creating pockets ah. of influencers by just 
um, equipping people with the car and the right tools to go ahead and talk about it and uh, therefore influence their particular circles. So uh, they, they could be both a good and a bad example, I would argue. Okay. Okay, yeah, because that Ford uh, Fiesta uh, campaign did go very well. On this next slide, uh, Jiren, we've got something that, uh, you know, you move from influencers or people who can help you to choosing the correct platform. And we covered this a little bit on the last webcast, but I think it's important to, to emphasize again, each of these platforms has a specific business use, correct? That is correct, and I would even say, um, you know, you would not even just go with your business use, but you would say, mm -hmm. what content do I have from before? And again, where are my users already at? So I think you're looking, when you look at the platform selection, it's l number one, looking at the content that you know you can leverage, and then number two, looking at the users that you're trying to reach and identifying where that target market is already located. Had an example of this, Jaron. Uh, uh, we're putting together uh, some work with HTML5 and a couple of uh, other certifications. And uh, so I said, well, let's go ahead and put something up here on Facebook and something on Twitter. And I got a good lesson on saying, well, if we're going to be approaching professionals, maybe LinkedIn's a better platform for this, right? It, it's that kind of, you know, what is the appropriate platform, right? That is correct, yeah. I mean, um, you can look to the demographics of each of these tools is shifting dramatically day in, day out. So, for example, um, Facebook yeah. was kind of the hot college scene, and now you look, their largest growing demographic would be uh, international as well as women ages 40 to 60. So, uh, and, and then you'll know, like HTML5, cutting edge technology, one might make the case that Google Plus very well could be your technology platform of choice because that tends to be an early adapter type thing where uh, you know, early adapters are congregating right now is Google Plus. So it, is, is it happening? Uh, last time uh, you were saying you got the four big platforms or so and then maybe four and a half to five with Google Plus. Is it happening? Is it stalling or still hard, kind of early to tell? Mm, meh. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's still hard to tell. <laughs> That's how I feel about it. Yeah. 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 It's uh, you know, there's certainly again, there's pockets. There are there are people that are kind of um, pitching their tent and camping right on the Google Plus platform, and there, <laughs> um, there's you know, we've seen kind of a plateau after that initial uh, release of the software. A ton of people migrated to it, and now it's kind of its growth is stagnated slightly. Um, I think that it still just has a long way to go. There's a um, time will tell. I think. Okay, so uh, Facebook, you talked a bit about the, the typical demographic there. Uh, Twitter, uh, people, um, I mean, they want, don't people want to do, in, uh, engage in a lot of conversations with Twitter, you know, lots of back and forth, or are the people going to Twitter because they just want a, a quick update? You know, what, is it both? It, it could be both. You know, I, the one thing that I do like yeah. about Twitter is that it does serve some specific purposes really well. For example, we'll talk about customer service and how, um, you know, Twitter yeah. does offer that. It's almost like it's embedded within it that that real-time instantaneous feedback is much more ingrained within Twitter than, say, LinkedIn, for example. And so um, okay. while there's plenty of uses for Twitter because it's so simple, it can be a utility that crosses many different purposes, I would argue that, um, you know, you can use it for just about anything if you find the right set of content or use cases. Uh, one thing I will point out about Twitter is that recently with the newest um, release of the Apple iPhone and their new operating system, they've seen an explosion in growth. And, you know, you see it was more of a 20 to 30-year-old type of uh, demographic, and now you're seeing that expand um, above the 30 demographic. I would argue that even below 20, it still hasn't caught on as much, which is surprising mm -hmm. in my opinion. But, you know, those, yeah. those kids love their texting. Yeah. Yeah, texting is gonna. Yeah, it's like text, text versus Twitter, which is it? You know, it's almost an either or in some demographics, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, and you let's know, one, one platform that we didn't even touch on, I will throw it out there real quick, is uh, you know, Tumblr is exploding in growth, and especially for that younger demographic. So that's one that, if you aren't familiar with it, I would argue that it's worthwhile just taking a peek at it. It's a little bit more. Um, it has a little bit more substance than say like a Twitter feed, but serves a, a very similar process in, in simple broadcasting. Give everybody a quick uh, URL on that Tumblr. Uh, T U M B L R dot com. Good. Okay, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Well, let's get into some case okay. studies here, specifics here. Um, for example, when it comes to product launches, the next couple of slides we'll be talking about product launches yeah. and getting brand awareness. T tell me a bit about some of the strategies that you've done with you know specific examples. Yeah, so what we'll do is we'll kind of backtrack, I think, into this one, going over that framework that we talked about earlier. The business objective here obviously being the we want more people to know about us, whatever that may be. And um, 
when it comes to getting a brand out there, um, such as, you know, PMI is listed here, but I would even go so far as some of the other ones that we've used, we do kind of three things. Number one, with Twitter, we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll look and see what are people already saying about the particular area that I'm interested in. So for this particular mm -hmm. example, um, they were launching a new certification on something that web folks might be aware of, Agile, which is a project uh, uh, management style. And so they go out there and they search what are people saying about Agile, what are they saying about Agile certification, who are the key influencers, what hashtags are they using, and then from there what they do is they go ahead and they start following some of these key people. Now keep in mind on Twitter when you follow someone, that person gets a notification saying so and so is following you. I've uh, you know stumbled across quite a few brands by uh, just them following me and uh, you know, kind of like you all of a sudden get that alert, and that's an opportunity from which someone can learn about you. And so, I would say right. when you look at brand awareness, especially within Twitter, uh, get an idea of what's being said about you in your industry. But then go through in the process of potentially following a lot of people to get some notoriety out there. Notoriety is key. Then that's that's kind of the platform uh, for that. Then. Yeah, I think it's it's following people that are already in there so that they start to be aware of your brand as well okay. as getting a good understanding of what's being said um, in the context of that particular platform, in this case, Twitter. Okay, so Twitter gives you the context then. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, very good. Uh, you know, you also did something with Pearson View uh, registration, and this uh, I'm curious to see what you're able to do with YouTube uh, on this next uh, slide, Sharon. Yeah, so this one, uh, you know, YouTube serves a, a great uh, value when it comes to how-to videos and simple video formats. So um, one of the yeah. things that we have done, this isn't so much marketing uh, as, as far as brand awareness, but it is something where, you know, if you're changing the way, especially when it comes to software website, the way that things are laid out or the way that a user behaves with them, you can easily create something called a screencast, which um, is essentially taking a video of what's happening on your computer monitor and post that out to YouTube. People will oftentimes stumble upon that via Google searches or within YouTube itself. Uh, another example that I'd like to use with this one was uh, there was a plumbing supply company that I was working with, you know, that said, we don't really feel as though we belong in social. You know, we, we sell, you know, pipes to plumbers and engineering products sure. around that. And so, you know, it yeah. doesn't exactly scream hashtags and Twitter. But, you know, what we talked about is that if they were to go ahead and create some very simple two to three minute how-to videos of their engineers using their products, they could easily get some more traction and notoriety around their products. So, um, you know, it was something where they, the people that might not make it, be making the purchasing decision um, would be influenced, though, by their how-to videos, and therefore it could have a little bit of a ripple effect, or if nothing else, a little more notoriety for them. A bit more notoriety. Well, I mean, wasn't there a politician who talked about the internet being a series of tubes? I mean, that works with plumbing, doesn't it? <laughs> no, <just> kidding. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, I can't help it. No, well, sorry. The one that, that I was going to call light to, I think um, many of you may be familiar with it. It was a uh, promotion that was done by uh, not myself, but another firm called Will It Blend, and um, essentially yeah. they had a high-end blender, and they would take very expensive items, stick it in the blender, and blend it up. It turned into this viral phenomena where um, people wanted to see an uh, iPhone blend, you know, prior to this no one had even heard of this particular, well, I shouldn't say no one had heard, but you know, it was a relatively unknown blender company, you know, who, who takes the time to figure out what brand of blender they want to go after, but because of this viral video, they actually got a lot more product awareness. I love it. I love it. I, I've watched that with my kids. They uh, brought it up to me, so they're, they're trying to make that hip, you know, so but, you uh, that was a lot of fun well, watching cool. that. It's cool stuff, isn't it? But when you're making these videos, what particular, um, you know, codec or whatever are we using uh, to upload them uh, to YouTube? YouTube takes care of that? What's the story there? Yeah, fair question. On that one, um, you know, one of the great things about YouTube is that lo-fi or low yeah. fidelity, in other words, not a high overarching, you know, expensive production is necessary to be cool or popular. So, um, you know, Flipcam is no longer in business via Cisco, but you can still find them out there at dirt cheap prices. Otherwise, a simple cell phone camera can serve the purpose as well of um, creating your video. So, in this case, I would say uh, low tech and low fi is by all means acceptable and or encouraged. It has, um, because we're using social tools, this idea of being kind of a real person and adding your personality into the video and not being perfect speaks well for you and potentially gives you more credibility at times. You know, I've uh, created uh, uh, 
video using all three of those things, from cell phone to, to uh, uh, well, both of those, cell phone and also flip cam, uh, the old, you know, dead Cisco products, sadly dead. Um, also did a webcast one time where they used all sorts of fancy gear, and they were saying, you know, I don't know why we're setting all this up for you, James. You know, it was a great little, what, a half hour long. YouTube thing took forever, but it was funny because they said we're, we're going to be uh, bringing this right down to you know YouTube quality anyway. So uh, right. that was, it was inter interesting to see. Yeah, your question on codec and some of that stuff. In other words, you know, like what type of resolution and what format and all that stuff. Right. You'll, yeah. you'll find uh, within YouTube uh, they're pretty flexible on that. So if you're using one of the standard low fidelity methods that we just mentioned, by all means, you should have no issues getting that up into YouTube. And then YouTube even does offer um, some online editing. Uh, features for you. If you want to do some very basic cutting and splicing of the video, you do have that option as you load into YouTube. They've made it easy, and so one of the things that wanted to get across with this particular slide was that as you get into this, don't worry about using YouTube native tools or the resolution because people do expect something, well, quick and dirty, don't they? Yeah, and so again, the big takeaway here is that, uh, you know, within creating videos, don't overthink mm -hmm. it don't spend a lot of time. Think about basic yeah. things that you can offer your general community that will then be associated with your brand long term. Making and sense. short. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So Will It Blend was a great phenomenon and I would argue it's an outlier situation but you can get as basic as you want with how to things around your products or your brand and um, still potentially get a, a high return on investment. Very good. Thanks Jan. Uh, a, a great example. Now teachability yeah, right. Tell, tell everybody a bit more about uh, a bit about teachability and how you were able to use uh, Twitter uh, with uh, some product launch or some brand awareness. Issues. Yeah, this one's going kind of back to that first example that we showed with PMI, where they were doing a lot of market research um, to understand yeah. the agile community before marketing to them. Um, and then this one, I suppose, would be more of what I was kind of alluding to within that. But um, Teachability was an or is an online social network for teachers that Pearson spun up. Uh, we basically said, what if we got uh, a very simple social network for teachers to share ideas with one another. There's a lot of tools out there for teachers to network with one another, but they tend to be a little overly complex. And so, um, you know, about mm -hmm. a month ago, we went live with this website called Teachability. And getting there to that point, uh, we had to do a lot of guerrilla marketing. You know, we, we uh, wanted people to be involved and on the platform prior to our big launch so that we could have some sort of content and networking capabilities available to it by the time the big launch came around, but at the same time we didn't want to overly promote it so that when people showed up to the website they saw that there wasn't really a whole lot of substance to it yet. Uh, and so we talk about what we did within Twitter, which was our main vehicle. We didn't even use Facebook. So uh, I just want to highlight that real quick that all of your campaigns don't have to necessarily touch on each and every platform. This is a case where when we looked at the content that we had to provide, which was very little to start with, and we looked at our business objective of getting some awareness around our our new product, Twitter made the most sense. It was a way that we could subtly find people that are of influence as well as uh, subtly um, reaching out to people by following them to give them some sort of awareness that we even existed. Yeah. So, did it, did it also show how you, it, it doesn't readily show the community that you have very quickly. As you start building followers, people see that this is something that might be worth going to. Absolutely. And you know, yeah. I would even say so far as uh, um, there are certain ways in which you can do that that go outside of just broadcasting stuff about your website. For example, um, you have in there hashtags, find hashtags. One of the things that we did is we went to things called, um, they have tweet ups where you can literally follow a hashtag. Well, there's several variations of that, but essentially there will be a hashtag for like an hour period of time where everyone will be using that hashtag and dialoguing on the various things. And we leveraged a lot of those. We would just get involved in the conversation with the community. And yet again, simple way where we can dedicate an hour, but we can start having all the people that are following that particular hashtag be aware of us and our presence in this new community. You know, Jaron, there might be actually a couple people who uh, might be going to themselves, hashtag, what does that mean? Just take a step back just for a second, just so everybody, we know everybody on the call knows how, what, what those so mean and how those work. Yeah, hashtag is an organic type of um, uh, tagging mechanism on Twitter where um, you can associate whatever your content is with one kind of superseding hashtag. A great example of this would be at conferences, live events. A lot of times people will use a hashtag to associate anything that's being discussed about or at that conference um, to a particular resource. So therefore, I could search for that hashtag and see anything and everything that's being discussed around it. 
Um, cool. It's a way that you identify trending topics on Twitter. It's also a way that you can, um, yeah, group a bunch of what would seem disparate tweets all together under one heading. I've always seen it as kind of simple meta tagging of content, you know, so you can get yep. you know, drill right in. And it's cool because you can do it as an end user, but also you can start doing those searches to find out what people are saying about you, you know, Absolutely. about your own the, brand and that sort of thing. The consumption side of it is, I think, where a lot of the fun comes. So, you know, I might be following one or two people that will mention something here or there, but if I search for a particular hashtag, a bunch of people who I don't even know, I can get, you know, all kinds of stuff that they're saying around a particular topic. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. So we see that now, on the uh, screenshot over here, right, Jaron? What's that? Oh, we see that on the screenshot over here on the first tweet. Uh, where yes. Where it says uh, Pearson uh, CCSS. Yes, VCon 2011. Right. Yes, and then the Ed Chat. That was uh, okay. one of them in particular that a lot of teachers and people in the education space follow on a regular basis. They have a search saved where they'll just kind of see what's going on on the Ed Chat hashtag, and so that's one that we leverage a lot of times. Cool. Excellent. Okay. So there's an example there. Thanks, Frank, for pointing that out. Very good. Very good. Now, Frank and, and Jaron, uh, you know, for example, we have, uh, you know, at CIW, we have Facebook pages. Uh, and uh, we also use Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, so, you know, Jaron, you've, I know you've taken a, a look at these, uh, uh, at these web pages. But, Frank, you, you care to tell a little bit more about uh, our Facebook page and what we're doing with it? Just a couple of things okay. real quick. Yeah, well, initially, our main objective in having a social media presence was to enhance the CIW brand awareness. So uh, we did a research. Um, we looked at our top 25 customers and their social media activities, and we noticed that they're using Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Uh, that's like the most common share uh, platforms they're using. So we uh, thought of it those. Uh, with Facebook, um, we communicate with our audience through offering customer service, announcing upcoming events, uh, presenting details about CIW certifications, and discussing new CIW products and services. And we're talking about tangible results. Um, once we started posting the uh, events on Facebook, we saw a better turnout. Um, and uh, we did all this by using the customized tabs uh, that Facebook uh, offers. Uh, we created some customized tabs on the, on the left-hand side, and just the basics, um, uh, optimizing images and uh, using web-friendly files. With LinkedIn, okay. uh, we've, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Jaron and Frank, when it comes to, you know, you talk about web-friendly files or you talk about the features that are there, do you guys both find that keeping things as simple as possible is, is the key here? I mean, when it comes to actually designing various pages for Facebook or, or LinkedIn or Twitter, is simplicity the key, kind of like what we were saying with, uh, you know, YouTube videos? I think it goes it goes hand in hand with what you're trying to present. Um, with our product, mm -hmm. I think you know, CIW. It, it, we well, our audience. We're trying to keep it something simple and professional. So uh, we're not throwing some um, complicated image out there as our profile. We're showing our logo, and it's pretty much straightforward. Yeah, I would go ahead and say you know you can make a case that simplicity is always an overarching goal. You never, you know, no one really strives for complexity. So, um, but in social, more than ever, you want to because you know people's attention spans within Twitter and Facebook and these things they they tend to get very click happy. And so, you know, you talk mm. about how you always have a few seconds to make an impression. But I would say even within social media, because the user chooses what they follow or what their filters tend to be as far as what they will show up in their activity stream, you have to set an expectation very clearly and very quickly so that they can make that snap just judgment of whether or not you are going to be someone they subscribe to. Okay, okay. Now, uh, let's talk a bit, about, a bit more about, uh, anal a little bit about analytics. You know, what can you learn, for example, from a Facebook page? We've got a, a screenshot here of, of how you can go through some of the demographics and some of the interests. How are analytics important, and what do you do in regards to Facebook to study those, Jaron? Yeah, you know, uh, Following analytics within Facebook, they, that's a kind of a moving target. They're changing it on a regular basis. Um, but when you start a Facebook page, you will get some sort of grasp of how many people are following you, as well as how often whatever it is that you have on your screen is showing up on a particular um, user screen. So they call it impressions. So you get a general idea of how often this content is viewable. Um, you also get trend lines and things to that extent. Uh, so when you talk about purely analytics on Facebook, you get a couple of metrics that you can leverage. Um, so when you're building out your strategy for 
for say a Facebook page, you have some some things that you can create benchmarks around. Um, you know, like one of the things that we did recently around here with a new Facebook page that we launched was talk about within the first six months what seems like a reasonable number for us to have as far as subscribers or in this case likes right. as well as uh, impressions. And we, we set those and we're holding ourselves accountable to that. Um, and you know, one of the ways in which we're making sure that we meet that if we're if we're trending towards not meeting those numbers, we can do stuff like use Facebook ads. We've had a lot of great success um, using Facebook ads, which can be very targeted to a particular demographic or user without a lot of cost associated with it. Um, you know, I don't know. Are we going to talk about ads later, or should I kind of dive into No, Facebook I think this is a, let's talk about it right now. Let's talk about okay. it right now. Yeah. So um, within Facebook ads, one of the things that's great about this, whether you're talking social or just marketing in general, um, is that Facebook has a platform around their ads where you can literally go in there and start narrowing down the type of demographic information that you want to target and um, not pay a cent to understand it. So an example of that would be when we were launching this uh, social network for teachers, I was able to hop over into the Facebook ads area and get an idea of how many teachers are in the United States and or on Facebook already. And I can use that information to kind of target this is what full saturation would be for me in the US. In other words, this is the number of teachers that are savvy within social networks. And I can use that then as I'm building out my strategy around my community as well as my marketing. Frank, you've kind of hopped in there. Do you want to add something to that too? Yeah, yeah this is fairly new. We, we started to advertise last week and um, it is pretty exciting because you actually get a chance to look at specific demographics. Um, we've targeted specific colleges to advertise our CIW and um, you know it's, it's fairly uh, good with our budget. Um, you get to target the age group, um, the gender, what major they're in, what um, what interests they have. Um, so it, it is very uh, a very good tool. Yeah, one of the things that I will add around advertisements is be very clear about what your end goal is. Is that a like on your Facebook page? Is that a visit to your website? Is that a registration on your website or a sale? Mm -hmm. Make sure that you've identified that and then always be going back and looking at, um, based on that benchmark, how many people achieved it and how much am I spending so that way you kind of have this what I call a cost to conversion ratio. In other words, you, you, like within teachability for a long time when we were um, we were advertising on Facebook at, for a targeted group. We had an excuse me an idea of how much it cost us per registration, and we were always focusing on getting that number lower and lower, obviously. Or when it started to get too high, go ahead and kind of change our tactic. And so, using Facebook, you were able to, or you know, you feel you're going to be able to target what that is and figure out what that is. Absolutely, and you know, then we were able to, you know, push Facebook up against, say, Google Pay Per Click or some other advertising tools, and determine what worked best for our demographic and our goals. See, I, lo I love it. This way, you you actually set the goal before you ever start clicking on any Facebook page. This is correct. Yeah, you yeah. have that. Like we said, the business objective. What are we going after, and how are we going to yeah. measure it? Love it. Love it. Very otherwise, good. Otherwise, my salespeople that hold my hand in the marketing side of things get really frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. Well, when it comes to advertising, you've got Twitter and LinkedIn. We've got some prices here. You care to give a quick overview of how this can work? You know, what is this? Uh, Five thousand dollar threshold, and what are some of the options when it comes? Yeah, to so a quick Twitter. rundown yeah. of advertising on these different platforms. Yeah. Twitter, um, in other words, five thousand dollar threshold is saying you need that much just to play. Um, so if you want to spend a little bit more money, um, I would argue that you know for a lot of these nimble social marketing campaigns, unless you're a very large brand, that tends to be a very high cost. So it might not work for you. Um, so just kind of get that in mind. You're going from five all the way up. You know, sky's the limit. And they have three options within that. They have the ability to do um, a promoted account, a promoted trend, or a promoted tweet. What does that mean? It's, uh, it's basically a way of making whoever you are feel like it's native in the app. So a promoted tweet, for example, just looks like a standard tweet, although it's an advertisement with a link. But it's mm -hmm. always showing up prominently. So when you think about the promoted tweet account or trend, it's basically taking native functions that Twitter has and promoting them to the very top so that they're very visible to users. So in a sense, it's kind of like a Google-sponsored link kind of. Exactly. Thing. Yeah. yeah. When you look Return at page. Page. if you guys are familiar with the Google um, advertisements, obviously when you type in a search, yeah. then all of a sudden that pay-per-click ad shows up right underneath that search result. It's the first thing that you see. So they're using native Google functionality, but to promote um, things with an advertisement skew. Same thing happens here in Twitter. 
uh, good. LinkedIn, LinkedIn, however, they are using more of uh, the standard advertising model. So they will have, you know, uh, similar to Facebook, they will have just places on the screen, so screen real estate that is dedicated to advertisements. Um, you know, one of the things that I found within LinkedIn uh, is that it tends to be more text-based advertisement, so it doesn't jump out as much. And um, I haven't seen as much traffic in, within LinkedIn advertisements, although that's just with the particular uses that I've had. So um, given that the cost is $10 or so per day and things to that, that extent, I highly recommend experimenting with something on LinkedIn because who knows, it very well could be a very cheap way for you to um, go ahead and add likes, views, registrations, whatever it may be. So it's an inexpensive but yeah, powerful tool. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And again, LinkedIn has the same type of kind of demographic slicing that uh, Facebook does. So you could target specific professionals or uh, specific regions, things to that extent, with your ads. How about StumbleUpon? You know, StumbleUpon is one that I've just started playing with and been getting some rather good results on. Uh, StumbleUpon is a web. I don't know even know how you describe it. It's essentially a little user bar that'll show up in your browser, and uh, you give it some sort of data about what you like or what you're interested in. Hit a button, and it stumbles on to a new website. Um, and you can just, as a user, you can um, sit there and stumble upon multiple different websites or um, things on the interwebs that you're interested in. As part of that, they also then bring in advertisements every now and then, so you essentially stumble upon an ad. Um, they, get, they have three different pricing options and a lot of really good metrics, and I would highly recommend, again, trying some experimentation if you um, have the appetite for it to see if it's potentially something that could add to your audience. And uh, Darren, good. are these ads uh, specifically towards the, uh, the subject that you're searching or uh, interested in? Absolutely, yeah. Again, you do have some... Um, you do have some options when it comes to segmenting out who would be seeing your ads and why. Okay, so it's kind of like what the old delicious has been delicious, how you put it right, except it sounds like it's you know, much more social in nature. Yeah. yeah, you know, and one thing that I point just generally overall on advertising is that um, when you think about it, it's, uh, it's no longer I find a website and then I advertise to that based on the demographic of, I know, you know, like ESPN, people who like sports will be there at that demographic. These types of social advertising are much more fine-tuned and granular in who they're displaying their ads to. So just something to keep in mind if you were to try and go this route. Very good. Very good. When it comes to customer service, what are some of the, uh, you know, you basically have the need to create a more user-friendly, useful set of uh, pages. How have, uh, you know, Facebook and Twitter been useful for you in doing this? Let's yeah. say with Pearson View Military or, or you know, Comcast Care and Dell. Yeah, so with um, Comcast Cast Cares and Dell, those are two companies that uh, very well could be the poster children for bad customer service at one point in time, or maybe still, but regardless, what they've done is they've managed to change their brand or their perception um, a lot having to do with their influence on Twitter and the way that they created yeah. real-time events, and not so much just the fact that they are there and available, but it's the people that are available to operate in real time. For example, um, I think it was within Dell where they had a very high up uh, individual who was the one who kind of started this initiative and in reaching out to people, understanding what the problem was and how he could help. So not only are people getting better customer service because it's happening in real time, but they're getting it from you know, a real person. It's not some faceless, nameless person out in a call center or halfway around the world, but in fact it's someone that they can kind of relate to. It, it brings the power of social, which is a true, you know, personification of a brand, into the customer service realm. I think there's huge payoffs to be had here if you um, can manage it. Now when we talk about managing customer service on this, uh, depending on your brand, oftentimes it is not a huge uh, onerous task. So, you know, I, I run into people that say, you know, we just don't have the time or the resources to dedicate to something like this. But I would make mm -hmm. the case that uh, if you set it up and manage it correctly, it is something that uh, should be an option for just about any organization of any size. Within just a few days, if you have any any sort of team at all, you can set this up. And and you're right, Comcast has had a brand, uh, you know, some some issues having to do with support. But it's interesting to see how they've used these uh, tools to to turn that around a bit. Yeah. So again, go back to your framework of what's your strategy here. We want to provide better customer service or more personal customer service. Um, what kind of content do we have? In this case, you 
don't really need to have content, you don't need a bunch of canned scripts or reports. I would argue that you just have someone who knows your business well enough that they can, that you're comfortable with them responding in a public setting. That's, you know, the, the content that you have here, the asset that you have as a good employee. And then um, you go into the platform of choice. In this case, I would argue Twitter's a great one to have out there as well as um, we've done some stuff with Facebook as well. Um, being able to answer things. And both of these, you do have ways in which you can go ahead and get notifications set up. So if you have that concern of what if I'm not around or available, um, you don't have to be going out to the sites, in other words, on a, uh, over and over again on a daily basis, but you can actually have notifications pushed out to you so you can you know, swoop in and handle issues when necessary but not be on the hook for being out there and catching them. I love how, you know, they, I love how they do this to show that they have you know, access to experts. You know, if you're getting getting into Dell or getting into Comcast or whatever, these tools are showing that you are getting a direct feed into people who really know what they're doing, and that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, and you'll even see like uh, a company like Best Buy who tried to essentially route all customer service issues. Um, they called it, I believe it was, uh, wow, I'm going to screw up the name of it. But anyways, they would distribute this to a variety of em employees within their organization to try and respond back to them. They didn't have the best results with it in the sense that people just didn't really use it. But still, the, the principle is there in that like anyone within your organization could potentially become a customer service um, representative. And I would even um, argue, or I've seen some articles that say, you know, companies that really get this, a lot of times they have leadership who, who understand that their role could very well be customer service and have no problem rolling up their sleeves and getting involved. And if you look at Zappos and Best Buy and Dell for, as examples very of that. Good. Yeah, having a timely response is really important for these uh, platforms. Yeah, you know, oftentimes I'll make the case to uh, people within the organization that it's not about the quality of the response, it's the timing of the response. If you set it off by being responsive right away, they will give you the time to go ahead and sort up the problem correctly. Very good, very good. Now, when it comes to events, which is kind of how Twitter started anyway, um, you, you had some experience with the Association of Test Publishers. Uh, you know, uh, Pearson View works a lot, you know, obviously in the testing industry. And you were able to use LinkedIn and, uh, and Facebook, for example, with uh, certain events. Tell me more about if you're trying to do, you know, one-off events or, you know, once-a-year events, how can these platforms help real quick? Yeah, so here's a strategy, you know, if we go back to our framework of trying to get people more involved with whatever the association or the um, company could be, or um, in this case it wasn't an association, but it could be a company or anything to that extent, how we can get them involved in more than just the once-a-year event or, you know, mm couple of times a year events. And so what we did is, um, and whether if it's a company, you can get a subset of employees. If it is an association, there's oftentimes volunteers that are willing to be accountable. And um, something that we've done is that we've um, set up a series of editorial calendars where we, you know, we'll take two volunteers and say, this week, week X is yours, and here's a topic we'd love to have you go out there and post. And the purpose behind this is to try and get dialogue going year-round so that when our events come around, we have uh, more connections, we're networked to more people and have a better understanding of backgrounds, but also so that people who may not know about our association or our events could be drawn into these dialogues and that could be their way into coming to an event. Okay, so you get more people to come to the event, for example, through LinkedIn. Absolutely. Okay. You know, you're, you're kind of, you're getting more value to the people that are already members. You're attracting more members as well as you're um, bringing something that you can mention while you're on site. So, for example, okay. we have, um, you know, we're going to be highlighting certain discussions that we have on LinkedIn on site. And we're also highlighting within our, um, you know, our kind of traditional marketing schemes some of the discussions that are taking place on LinkedIn. And then you were able to uh, have uh, a Pearson view. You were going to have a. You basically had a party, and were able to use Facebook to get more people to show up and dress like the '80s. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Well, kind of. I mean, <laughs> from the supply to the ridiculous. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So this yeah. one, we're using native functionality that Facebook has to offer, which is their um, okay. events. And what we did is we wanted to make sure that people were um, aware of what style of a, of a party we were throwing. In other words, not just that it was, you know, an 80s event where everyone's going to be dressed as 80s, but a way that it's casual, fun. It's a way to kind of let your hair down at this otherwise professional conference and have a little bit of fun. And so we set the tone by setting up a Facebook event, which is obviously more social platform in nature as opposed to LinkedIn. And we posted pictures of ourselves when we were in the 80s. We actually invited other participants to go ahead and post their own photos of them in the 80s. You know, um, we, we saw that our clients and our customers were trying to guess who was who from the 80s. It turned out to be a lot of fun. And it was um, all around just making sure that we set a tone of informal fun for our event you, through a social tool. 
and you were able to do this basically uh, 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 in the same way that South by Southwest, right, it's an old uh, 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 film festival, was able to first use Twitter, right, as a platform to get people, uh, you know, dialoguing about the event, right? Isn't that effectively what we're looking to do here, uh, what you're I, looking to do? Kind of. I feel like, you know, this one's ah, more of okay. using Twitter as a... Uh, a means by which you can um, engage your customers on site on ah, an event. Okay. So we talked about that hashtag, using that hashtag in order to make sure that you are um, uh, showing up under searches that people would have. But uh, I'm trying to think here. If we want to look at events and Twitter usage, I would say there's a couple of mm -hmm. takeaways. Number one, make sure that you know the hashtag that will be used for that event. So in other words, what are people going to be searching for if they want to hear what's going on at the event in real time? Number two is to um, make sure that when you are posting items out onto the you know, hashtag for that particular conference, make sure that you're giving more than you're uh, taking away. In other words, uh, respond to people in real time. Um, respond to what other people are saying and don't just use it as a publishing mechanism because that gets into a spammy world and you actually do more damage to your brand than you do help it. The other thing that I will point out is um, URLs. If you um, use something called a URL shortener, uh, if you want to write this down, bit.ly, bit.ly is an example of a free service that you can use. Um, by shortening your URLs and embedding them into your tweet, you can see how many people click on the links that you post out there. So you could, for example, in a conference tweet would be, um, come check out our booth at, you know, whatever the booth number is, and learn more about X, and then have a URL and the conference hashtag. Now I can go ahead and see how many people click through and, um, you know, how much value that tweet actually had for me and my organization. Again, going back to metrics. Very good. Excellent. Now, uh, just to kind of finish things up here, uh, uh, Jaron, there are some things, the uh, Thank You Economy, that's a, a, a title that you particularly like. Uh, also, another one called uh, We Are All Weird. These are uh, sources that resources that you find are useful. Is that right? Yeah, these are uh, two books that I would highly recommend. Of, um, being that I'm in this space and it's changing constantly, I find myself being somewhat of a bookworm. These are two that stood out to me um, very strongly. The Thank You Economy talks about kind of the way in which, um, you know, we're almost taking a step backwards with social tools. It, it was, you know, all about the neighborhood market, and you had to be friendly, know the person's name, and that was a differentiator that got you the sale. Then we kind of moved into this more, you know, factory mentality of being more efficient, more cost-effective, and more convenient. That's what won me the sale. Now it's almost like a blending between those two models. I have to still be cost-effective and, um, you know, efficient and convenient, but I also have to go back and have some sort of personal connection with my users. Using social media, that not only is possible, but it's somewhat expensive. So I like that one a lot. Uh, we are all weird. Also talking about how kind of mass marketing is slowly decreasing in this kind of distributed social marketing is taking over and why. So that one's a very quick read by Seth Godin. Um, and then for following people on Twitter, you know, you have to, what sold me on Twitter a long time ago was the idea that I had access to experts that I didn't necessarily know uh, existed. And through Twitter, I can understand what they're up to, see the resources that they're looking at, and even respond to some of the things that they're posting out there. If you are looking for the resources um, to follow on Twitter, I would argue if you type in just social, um, on the right-hand side of those search results, oftentimes they'll, they'll kind of give you a list of people who are influential in that particular keyword, and you can see a whole list of individuals that might be of interest to you to follow. Perfect. That's that's a great tool. It's a great way to you know to learn very quickly. Right. Exactly. Then, right. It's, it's, you know, obviously the last two are just simple websites that I, I tend to frequent, um, for getting an idea of where the industry is at and where it's heading. Quick reads, um, resources. There's again, this is by no means uh, the full list of resources that you should look at, but just a couple that if you want to get started, I, I would argue would be a good place to go. So MashableWebStrategist.com, and there are a couple other tools here uh, that we have that you guys, that you anyone can take a look at by downloading our uh, the PDF of this particular slide deck. So, uh, Jaron, thank you so much for uh, the time that you've uh, given us and given us insights into how to use social networking uh, and yeah. business. Very much appreciate it. And Frank, thank you so much for your insights as well. Um, what we've uh, got here when it comes to CIW is you can learn about the basics of social networking and Web Foundations Associate. And also, in our Web Design Professional Certification, you'll learn more about how to use social networking um, and a, an entire holistic perspective using development and the top uh, uh, using development tools and the best uh, best practices of design as well. 
um, as far as anybody having any questions, uh, any uh, questions that we have for Jaron at this point. Lisa, do we have any questions that uh, have been put through the uh, uh, through the chat window? Uh, at this time, there's no specific questions about, about the uh, webinar itself, about the event, your presentation. Um, okay. We've had a, a, some chatter about events coming up and, and um, uh, you know, the issues we had at the start of the session. Um, uh -huh. One person did ask if, if Jaron's email address is available to sh share with our attendees. If Jaron, if you're willing to provide that. You know, uh, if it's if it's not on the um, presentation, by all means, I have. Uh, I think if we want to get social about it, I'm on Twitter. You can easily find me there or via LinkedIn. So um, you know, I, yeah. I'm trying to push the social because that's my realm. But um, otherwise, I, I certainly can provide that in the PowerPoint that you distribute later on, James. You bet. You bet. Well, real quick, what's your uh, Twitter uh, account? To that? Yeah, to it's um, at Jaroni. It's J R O N I U S. So Again, uh, at Yep. And then J R O N I U S. Is that right? That is I'm going to type that in. Okay. Yeah, that is so correct. There you go. All right. Excellent. So that's that's very good. Uh, I think that's the best way to get a hold of Jaron. Absolutely. Well, if there aren't any other uh, questions uh, for this, understand you can follow uh, not only Jaron on Twitter, but you can also follow CIW on Twitter at twitter.com. Uh, you can also follow us at Facebook, uh, forward slash CIW. And the LinkedIn URL is huge, extremely long, so we used a tiny URL to shorten that up. And, you, again, you'll be getting a, a, power, a PDF of this PowerPoint slide so that you can follow us on um, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn, depending on your preference. That's right, yes, we will be sending out the slide presentation to everyone who's attended today's event. Uh, this event's being recorded, and so we will also post that on our website within a few days as well. That's right, that's right. So once again, Sharon, thank you very much for your time, and Frank, thank you so much for uh, your time and insights. Everyone, we uh, want to thank you, but want to thank you for your time and showing up for this webcast, and I think I'm just going to turn the time over to you, Lisa, to uh, close us out. We'll go ahead and wrap it up then. Thank you very much, James and Jaron and Frank, and uh, thank you everyone for attending, and thank you for your patience.